This episode discusses Jung's childhood experience of two personalities, directed in fantasy thinking, the psychological and visionary mode of creativity, and the psychoid archetype. These points are essential for understanding Jung's conceptualization of the visionary mode of creativity. This episode is part two of a series that considers how useful a Jungian orientated framework is in developing an appreciation of visionary art. In Memories, Dreams and Reflections, Jung wrote about his experience in childhood of having two personalities the sense of two inner selves which he labelled number one and number two. His number one personality reflected his persona, the mask worn to indicate the role he played. He describes, Somewhere deep in the background, I always knew that I was two persons. One was the son of my parents, who went to school and was less intelligent, attentive, hardworking and decent. This was the rational depiction of Jung that existed for the exterior world to see. It was clear and definable. As he aged, he realised that science met the needs of his number one personality. This part of him was rational and enjoyed concrete facts and scientific investigations. In contrast, Jung describes his personality number two as sheer nonsense, with no definable character and was instead a total vision of life. He describes it as grown up, old in fact, sceptical, mistrustful, remote from the world of men but close to nature. Where science met the needs of number one, the human or historical studies provided beneficial instruction for number two. From these self-observations and his early experiences in psychiatry, Jung developed a theory on contrasting modes of thought. Directed thinking and fantasy thinking. Directed thinking reflects Jung's number one personality and works with speech and language for the purpose of communicating and is essentially exhausting for an individual. Whereas fantasy thinking depicts a sheer nonsense of his number two personality, which exists spontaneously, guided by unconscious motives and is effortless. For comparative reasons, consider the experience of writing an essay. With this practice, we must direct our thoughts in a linear fashion to produce coherency. This is directed thinking. Now imagine sitting at your desk at school and your thoughts begin to drift, jumping from images to feelings, thoughts and emotions in the form of daydreams. Here, your thoughts are not directed in a linear fashion, and instead jump around effortlessly. This practice is a form of fantasy thinking. Directed thinking, or logical thinking, produces innovations and is adapted to reality. This mental process is a manifested instrument of culture and has been shaped with great force by education for centuries. Educational systems have been largely focused on teaching directed thinking, forcing our mental capacity to develop from the subjective individual sphere to the objective social sphere. The use of directed thinking is a new development in the history of the world and was unknown to earlier ages. In contrast to directed thinking, fantasy thinking turns away from reality and sets free subjective tendencies. When we are not thinking directly, our thoughts lack all dominant ideas and sense of direction. Jung describes how we no longer compel our thoughts along a definite track, but let them float, sink or rise according to their specific gravity. At this point, we are no longer thinking in language. Images pile upon images and feelings upon feelings. Common speech thinks of this type of thinking as dreaming. The people of the Greek classic era moved in a world of fantasy, untroubled by the outward course of things. The myths and stories from this period have remained unrivaled in the Western world as sources of imagination and attractive ideas. Poets and artists from ancient times to the present have derived inspiration from Greek mythology and have discovered contemporary significance and relevance in classical mythological themes. The activity of the classic Greeks was in the highest degree artistic, their goal was to adapt reality aesthetically to subjective fantasies and expectations as opposed to understanding the real world as objectively as possible. Thus, there arose a picture of the universe which was completely removed from reality as we now know it. Jung describes how children also think in a similar manner. They exist in the world of marvels, which is expressed through their imaginative play. 
Jung saw connections between the mythological thinking of ancient man and the thinking found in children, early tribal communities and dreams. The visionary and psychological modes of creativity directly correlate with fantasy and directed thinking, and in turn, Jung's number one and number two personality. The psychological mode relates to directed thinking. It is called psychological because it remains within the limits of the psychologically intelligible. Jung describes, The psychological mode works with materials drawn from man's conscious life, with crucial experience, powerful emotions, suffering, passion, the stuff of human fate in general. The raw material of this kind of creation is derived from the contents of man's consciousness, from his eternally repeated joys and sorrows, but clarified and transfigured by the poet. Countless creations belong to this category. Whatever form they may take, their contents always originate from the sphere of conscious experience. The most obvious examples of this category, in relation to the fine arts, is the pop art of Andy Warhol, the realism of Gustave Courbet, and the impressionism of Claude Monet. These works are produced completely from the artist's intention to produce a particular result. In contrast, the visionary mode is related to fantasy thinking. Jung describes it as something strange that derives its existence from the hinterland of man's mind, as if it had emerged from the abyss of pre-human ages. It is a primordial experience which surpasses man's understanding and to which, in his weakness, he may easily succumb. Works of this type force themselves upon the artist, bring in their own form. The artist becomes overwhelmed by a flood of thoughts and images which he never intended to create and which his own will could never have brought into being. Examples of this category in relation to the fine arts is the visionary works of William Blake, the pseudo-abstract paintings of Hilma af Klint and the outsider art of Adolf Wolfley. With this creative mode, the artist is separate from the process of creation. He feels as though he is subordinate to his work or stands outside it, as if he was a second person. These fantasies or visions represent a deeper and more impressive experience than the human passion depicted in works created within the psychological mode of creativity. The real symbol remains a constant challenge to our thoughts and emotions. Jung suggests that this explains why a symbolic work is so stimulating and grips us so deeply. It is important to note that psychological and visionary art are linked categories that are pushed apart to polar extremes. Both psychological art and visionary art are not completely exclusive. Psychological art can demonstrate a visionary core and vice versa. The visionary mode of creativity produces visionary artworks that depict archetypal imagery. Jung attempted to understand, through amplification, the underlying similarities of the archetypal image and potentially the psychoid archetype. The archetype is divided into two parts in analytical psychology, the psychoid archetype and the archetypal image. The psychoid archetype is the name given to the real nature of the archetype. Jung describes... It seems to me probably that the real nature of the archetype is not capable of being made conscious, that it is transcendent, on which account I call it psychoid. According to Jung, the true archetype can never be truly known or understood. Instead, it communicates its meaning and effects through archetypal imagery, which is symbolic. The archetypal image is not as pure as the psychoid archetype, as it is blurred by the material of conscious existence. Jung describes how a visionary experience is often cloaked in a historical or mythical event which can be mistakenly taken to be the real subject matter. But the deeper meaning of the work does not lie in the historical or mythical material, but in the visionary experience it expresses. The archetypal image can be understood as the distorted reflection in a pond, whereas the psychoid archetype is the figure being reflected. Since the creative expression can never match the true psychoid archetype or richness of the symbol, 
The artist must have a large collection of visual material to communicate a fraction of what he experienced, and must make use of difficult and contradictory images in order to express the strange paradoxes of his vision. Jung describes the visionary product as sublime, pregnant with meaning, yet chilling the blood with its strangeness. It arises from timeless depths, glamorous, demonic, grotesque, and it bursts asunder our human standards of value and aesthetic form.